Hello and welcome back to another episode of Farm and Life at La Four. So today I'm up near Bundaberg and we're on a cattle farm here. Um, so I'm going to go around and film. So Jack is going to be talking to us a little bit about his cattle today. So he runs a farm here where they do Tully cattle. And so he crossbreeds them and does AI and embryo transfers as well. So he will talk to us all about that. And I'll get to show you around another farm here on our Australian series. So I really hope you guys enjoy it. If you do, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. You can also follow along the channel and hit the subscribe button if you want to stay up to date on any of our future episodes. Now, let's get to the video. infused genetic diversity by having all these other crossbreeds so we've got a red tuli, gold tuli and then another one so they're very slick well conditioned they um yeah they just do so much better than anything else so what sort of european breeds do you have in here so this is an experimental herd we've yeah. got um sort of a handful of each registered breed so we've got limousin blonde aquitaine charolais um, Baran, uh, Brangus, Murray Gray, yeah. uh, and, and Thule. And then all of them have had Thule bulls over them. Okay. Uh, with the aim of, yeah, I suppose as a trial to determine what the best combinations can be and what adds value to the to Thule. Yeah, and so how old are these calves here? They look these are only three months young. old. They're, they're little babies, so we've got uh, it's, a Murray, it's Murray Gray cross, we've got Simmental cross, uh, we've got Brangus cross, uh, uh, Charolais cross. So these are just, um, yeah, a small subset to, to try and work up with our crossbreeding. And then we've got a, a herd of full blood Thule and the Thule bulls that we take through to two years old. And so were them cows done just with the running with a bull or were they also done through AI? No, so we got some embryo calves. So we, we transferred embryos in. Yeah. We did some by AI uh, and we did some natural mate. So a bit of okay. everything. All right. So as you can see, the main things we're trying to do is, is remove the coat. So you can see how hairy a lot of the Euro breed. So we've got Red yeah. Angus, Limousin, Blonde Aquitaine there. And we've got some Drakensberger, so the horned animal, that 945 yeah. is a full blood Drakensberger. The Frisians are just recipients, um, so, so they're just carrying embryos for us. Um, yeah, but the, and then some of the crossbreeding, so these, that's a Brangus, Brangus Thule heifer, it's Brangus cross Thule bull. Um, that's a Mashona, Mashona cross Thule. Um, so, yeah, and then there's a Murray Gray cross Thule, so it's a good, good little combination. That one behind's an embryo, and sort of a Thule embryo calf. Um, yeah. And so you're saying about um, taking kind of the, the fluffiness off them and having them nice and slick, does that help them against parasites or just against the weather? Yeah, parasite uh, ticks. Yeah. Um, heat tolerance. Um, so Thule's a, a nice ingredient breed. It corrects a lot of traits so it tightens up sheath reduces any hump because there's no indicus content uh, reduces ear size so for market acceptance when people don't want uh, brahmin but they want heat tolerance yeah uh, and tuli's got the equivalent meat quality to angus as an adapted taurus they as a desert animal they put their fat intramuscularly as opposed okay. to on the outside so they've yeah. got fantastic quality meat right that's good um, very good fertility and very good temperament, as you can see with all the animals around right. us. So you kind of need the Tully in the European breeds up here? 100%. You, the you, conditions are yeah, too rough. You, they're too rough. So these guys are, come, are okay coming out of winter, Yeah. Um, but they really suffer through the summer with tick, you know, tick load, parasite load, um, and they, they really struggle with you know, these lower protein coastal grasses. So we've got very low protein country. Um, so you need very efficient feeders or feed converters. So Thule have a unique gene in their saliva that allows them to retain 
15% more nitrogen out okay. of any food that they eat because they originate out of the desert. Yeah. They have to be able to get you know, protein out of any, anything available. You've got a curious little couple of calves. <laughs> Okay, and so how big is your farm altogether, I guess? So this this is uh, a long-term lease that we've got with okay. uh, Bundy Sugar. Yeah. Um, and so basically we, there, there's a, a couple of thousand acres and it's uh, all the country that's not farmed for sugar cane or macadamia. Yeah, okay. Um, so we're spread, spread all over the place and we, we operate as a bit of a cooperative with, with a number of... Uh, Sort of Thule and our composite breed is called a Solera. Um, okay. So we've got a lot of Solera cooperators that, for example, the Brangus, they'll have uh, embryos transplanted into yep. them. Um, so, um, yeah, they, it's nice to have a, a sort of a network of Solera cooperators um, that utilize one large property to, yeah, to, to produce the breed. Yeah, I can see that they're all pretty quiet. They're not too afraid to come up around us. No. So a big part of uh, our genetic selection as contributors is making sure docility is, yeah. is high on the agenda. We, you know, particularly with you know bigger cattle stations that we sell our bulls to. Mm -hmm. um, if there's you know young backpackers that are not necessarily experienced yeah. working on cattle properties, they don't you know they don't want they don't bone tempered want animals. A crazy one. So we put a lot of effort into genetic selection for docility because it's highly, her you know, heritable. Yeah. Um, and so any of the ones that we crossbreed, we want to make sure that they're not downgrading from a temperament point of view. Yeah. Any crossbreeding is primarily if we're wanting to evaluate extra muscle, any myostatin genes, any extra meat quality, any, you know, so, and to be honest, the we want to stabilize any any crossbred, so yep. we don't like to call it a composite. We rather call it a sequential rotational breeding strategy, okay. because we maintain a nucleus full blood herd of Thule, full blood Baran, uh, and then full blood HPR registered Angus, and then we'll we'll rotate the crossbreeding through those to produce a Solera. So that way you maintain hybrid vigor, you yep. maintain uh, you optimizing heterosis at sort of eighty seven percent. Um, in some instances, we'll do a four-way cross where we put Wagyu cross Thule, so okay. Waguli, over a Brangus. Right. And that gives us heat tolerance and toughness and parasite resistance and fantastic marbling and meat quality over um, a Brangus where we've got a high milking um, Angus component. Um, we're getting a little bit of extra bone and weight and hybrid vigor and maintaining slick coat and toughness from a Brahmin mm -hmm. side uh, but that way we're getting four breeds stabilized crossing back to each okay. other and we you know we should then get a uh, even better heterosis of, of all yeah. of those traits okay and so how many cattle do you run on the farm uh, so about 400 um, and and then we're producing um, you know collectively I suppose close to 100 bulls um, and so uh, each, you know, each year we'll only really select the top 10 full blood Thule bulls. Okay. Um, then there'll be another 10 to 20, depends on, on the quality. Um, yeah. And then we'll do 10 to 20 F1s or crossbred bulls. Yeah. Um, and then with our other Solera cooperators, they'll have Angus Cross Mashona or Angus Baran. Um, so all the different cooperators that we sort of work with around the world will have slightly different compositions that make up a Solera. Okay, and so you're talking about F1. So F1 is the European cross Tully? Yep. Yep, and so you raise them yourself from calves? Yep, we retain all the, all the heifers, and then we'll go back to... So Solera's got to be at least 51% Sanger. So, okay. uh, of, so Sanger is the Southern African adapted taurus that's mm -hmm. made up of, so the, hundred, the full blood sangas are Nguni, Thule and Mashona. Okay. So so we've done Thule over a Brangus for example. Yep. That progeny will put back over um, either a Mashona if we need additional rumen function for a coastal animal yep. or back over Thule again if we 
Uh, and so that resulting progeny will be majority Sangha, but with a little bit of Taurus and a little bit of Indicus. All right. And so how long have you been farming yourself? Uh, so my, uh, you know, I've been in horticulture for the last 20 years. Um, and I grew up on a beef property in Zimbabwe yeah. with, you know, where we farmed Tuli, Mashana and Baran. Okay. Um, my grandfather farmed Baran in Kenya. Um, so it's, I suppose it's been in our family through different countries since 1950s. Right. Um, but I started up this sort of herd and project only in, in 20, 2020. Oh, yeah, so it's very young still. Yep. Uh, okay. But we sourced a lot of old genetics that were imported mm -hmm. to Australia by CSIRO. Yeah. And a couple of uh, other companies. So, so we, you know, majority of all the Thule bloodlines are from bulls that were collected in 1990 to 1993. Okay. And same with the embryos. Um, so, you know, we're sort of bringing back some fairly ancient or 35-year-old yeah. genetics. But then, you know, seeing if any of the crossbreeds from whatever is perceived as be improved genetics now adds any value. Um, to be honest, the full-blood Thule's are still outperforming everything else. Really? So, I was going to say, what would be your favourite cross so far out of what you've seen? Yeah, well, the Brangus Thule has been the, uh, been the been winning good. cross for us so far. Yeah. Um, and we like that because you can do red Brangus Thule or black Brang yeah. Brangus, so you can get black or red cattle. Um, and then, so some of these here, they're still uh, waiting to calve? Yeah, so this this 2108, there's a Brangus, Brangus cow with a Thule calf. Um, she should carve relatively soon. Yeah. She's been looking fatter and fatter. And then uh, is that back one just a that's limousine? A limousine? Yep. Then that horned one's a Drakensberger. Yeah. Uh, that one behind there is a, a blonde Aquitaine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some of them, some of them have, um, yeah, carved. Uh, so I think that the that black. Brangus Tulikoff's probably the oldest one in, over there. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we can go up and have a look at the bulls if you like. Because yeah, then definitely. you'll see the six month old wiener bulls. Yeah. And then the yearling bulls and the 18 month old bulls. All right, so perfect. that's sort of three, three sets of preparing animals for sale. And then yeah. we'll also retain a handful of them. All right, perfect. Let's go. Cool. Yeah, so you, so you can see these Murrays, uh, you can see their coat gets bitten and, you know, if you if you yeah. sort of just look there and there, Thule's just slick, beautiful coat, good milk. Um, you know, we look for that delicate, fine features. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can really see the difference in the coat. You know, so straight away for tick and parasite resistance, you can see with the Murray Grey and you see she's losing hair around her neck. Yeah. Um, they struggle condition-wise. She hasn't had a calf. She's on her third calf. Right. And it's she's in just, a lot better condition. Yeah, a lot better condition. Anne has just been raising cattle. Anne has got good milk and good meat quality. So it's just... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very different scenario. 15 months. Okay, so when the cow is 15 months old then? Um, and then they, you know, they should calve it too. <coughs> Whereas a lot of the Brangus, they're only getting joined at two. Right. So that early maturity, um, they're, they're just so much more productive because you get yeah. that early early maturity and... A bit more profitable maybe? Yeah. You know, you, they're smaller, their frame size and their mature car weight is less. Yeah. Um, but you can, you get a lot more of them. Yeah. And then they all calve every year? Yeah, so we, we shouldn't have a miss. And the big thing with Thule, there's the longevity. So particularly for a you know breeder herd, if you can retain your breeders for... You know, there, there's a couple of Thule cows in Central Australia that are 21 years old, still with a calf. Oh, so that's they, a long time. So they live for, yeah, a long time. A lot longer than the European breeds, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, yeah. So you sell the bulls at two, and then... And we don't sell females. And so you only sell uh, you only sell the bulls, you don't sell anything off for meat, or...? 
Uh, yeah, well then any 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 bulls that don't make the grade as a sale bull, they get yep. cut, fattened as steers and then sold as steers. Okay, yeah, yeah. but that's two years old as well. Um, yeah, it can be younger, so it's just weight. So we've got a cooperator that finishes for us and okay. then um, that's sort of 390, 400 kilos. So it doesn't matter what age, so as soon as they can get to that. Um, so yeah, this is... Uh, a three-year-old Thule bull, so he's just come back. We we sort of lease bulls out. Um, I don't know if his name's Quatcha, whether he's going to cooperate with us. Um, Quatch, come on. Hey, boy. Come on. He's too interested in the girls. Yeah, <laughs> he's just doing his job. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so these bulls just in paddock condition, as you can see, it's super dry. There's you know hardly any feed on the ground yeah and we just need to identify now who's going to be an easy doer and who's going to make it through before we then i suppose start supplement feeding them ready for sale see um, who can like yeah so if take we, the conditions if we have a look at you know so there's as i said three three generations so the two bulls on that side if you look at the condition difference and frame score so that middle bull he's called tom brady Tom Brady versus versus a much larger framed lankier bull yeah you know they just can't retain the same body condition and so on on felt conditions that's all we're trying to get is identify which bulls perform like Tom Brady okay you know so we're after flat top line good rumen function easy easy fleshing good fertility tight sheath pigmented feet eyes and nose mm -hmm. uh, slick coat um, so the the bigger framed animals will do better on feed, yeah. but they don't do as well on felt. Yeah. So this gold Thule bull over here, he's fantastic if you put him on feed, yeah. because he's got a big frame. But as soon as it's the protein drops out of the grass, they really struggle to keep weight on, and so he'll end up being a terminal type bull. So we'll use him to breed. You know, will someone that's finishing steers in a feedlot will buy him yeah because uh, he'll he'll add value whereas tom brady's a perfect maternal bull because he'll breed cows that that survive for a long time on on felt um, if you come around here you can sort of see a better side profile and um so how old is that bull so he's 16 months 17 months uh, and he's already, you know, been put to work in our own breeding program. Okay. Um, so we, we try and get sort of quite early. Um, but again, you can see all the slick coated Thule's. Yeah. Versus Drakensberger, you know, more skin marks, you know, everything else. So we, and there's different types of slickness. So this is short, coarse, thick. Uh, you know, slick versus that red bull up the front. He's that shiny slickness, which is a different sebum gland. Um, and which one is better for the rough conditions? Hard to know. Okay. Yeah, it's it's we're we're trying to breed more with the that red slick gene than the coarse short haired gene. Um, this guy here is a nice bull. He's um, so a lot of these young weaners. They've only just been weaned and yeah. and put in here. So. Um, this is a red Angus cross Thule, so you can see, if you remember how hairy the Angus was over there, now crossed with the Thule, it's come out a lot more slick. And the silver guys are Wagyu cross Thule. Okay. Um, hang on. Uh, so he'll have high marbling, good fertility, tight sheath, he, he's fantastic. He'll That's have great meat, yeah. yeah. Um, that little fella is just a, a, a full-blood Thule wiener bull. Um, 
So what age do you wean the bulls off at? Six months. Six months and then yep. they come straight in here? Yep. Uh, so those black bulls are, well, there's a few different ones. So mm -hmm. the one in front is a Drakensberger cross Angus. Yeah. Uh, that little fella coming is a full blood tule. They're, they're all hairy, they've just come out of winter, yeah. so they'll slicken off. The guy, the T16, he's actually a speckled park crossing Goonie. Okay. Uh, and he, yeah, he's shaping up nicely. Good masculinity, good top line, so he's got no indicus in him. Uh, these next ones, that's Drakensberger cross Angus, Drakensberger Angus, a new little full blood tule. Uh, weanable and that's a bigger full blood Drakensberger it's struggling because yeah just with the big bigger frame they they don't do as well on grass but yeah. they, they're fantastic if you've got high protein feed and in a you know so in the New England's um, this I like this bull he's he's a Drakensberger Angus a lot easier fleshing because he's so much more nuggety you know he's got short short legs Good top line. He's held his body condition a bit better than those bigger framed animals. Uh, good masculinity. You can see the flesh on the neck. Um, but again, the coat lets lets him down. We, yeah. We've got to we've got to get that sort of tooly slick gene in to knock the coat off because otherwise okay. they just get hammered with ticks and worms and yeah. parasites. And so, do you just sell off bulls, or do you sell off any of the semen, or? Yeah, and then we do um, both domestic and export. Okay. Um, semen and embryos sometimes um, semen we only try to collect the best or only offer for sale the best bull of each year okay so we will assess all of them and then only at, at sort of 16 18 months uh, we'll then collect the best bull mm -hmm. and same we'll collect him for export and domestic okay and where would you be exporting them to so most recent ones are paraguay um, argentina texas um, we just sent a load to Malaysia, uh, and and that's for crossbreeding with Angus for feedlots. So they want yeah. heat tolerance in their Angus, so yeah. they, they use Tuli over Angus. In a, uh, sending some back to Zimbabwe because they've been over here in Australia since the 90s now, and yeah, people are just looking to get back to that original selected mm. uh, stuff. Um, there's one of the farm guys. And so how many people are working on the farm? Uh, there's about five of us. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we all have other jobs. Yeah. So we sort of share farming, I suppose. Um, and then Bundy Sugar is the landlord, is, is obviously a massive, massive company. Yeah. Um, but we just run the cattle division. Um, and so the sugar cane around here, is that all for... It's all Bundy Sugars. It's all yeah. Bundy Sugars. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we've seen a, a bit of harvesting on the way in. Yep. Uh, you know, there's other small growers, but they're the dominant landlord yeah. in, the, in the area. Um, yeah, so we, we're lucky to have access to so much grazing land. Yeah. Um, and then, do, sorry, do you also supplement feed them, or is it just... At the moment, it's just this. And then as we come into sale, then we'll, you know, we'll start supplement feeding. Uh, and it, it also depends which target market the bulls are for. If yeah. we're selling them as a grass-fed breeder, then we won't supplement feed them. Yeah. But if we're selling them as a terminal grain-fed sire, mm -hmm. then we will. Okay. So it's sort of we, we'll mix and match depending on what we, which market we're selling the bull into. So it's got to be fit for purpose, and we we'll just then demonstrate the genetic potential. Mm -hmm. And and if that genetic potential is in an in a fed market, we'll feed it. If it's in a grass-fed market, we won't. Okay, so they're very adapted. Mm -hmm. And then when you. Um when you're feeding them, do you feed them just, do you just buy in feed or do you cultivate your own silage or anything like that? No, we're not making any of our own. We, we often do peanut hay, so the peanut tops once they've finished a peanut crop. Yeah. Um, and yeah, or we'll do up a, it's called a, a Thule starter mix. And so it'll be a, a bran and a bit of oats and, you know, a, yeah, a, a custom blend it. that we've developed. Okay. All right. So they just mainly just graze the... Yeah, well, we, and we're promoting a, a, we're trying to get our breeders bulls that will, perf bulls progeny that will perform on grass. Yeah. And so that they can get a, a grass-fed premium. And obviously the Sanger genetics, so the Thule and Guni Mashana, um, 
ought to um, provide great hybrid vigor to anybody, whether it's Brahmin or European breeds that yeah. buy our bulls. So we just sit in the middle as a very good genetic ingredient that can go in either direction. Okay. And so then, um, how has it been for grass this year? It's, it seems very dry up around this it's way now. It's dry as anything. So this is heading back into an El Nino year. And so the one thing we're trying to do is produce bulls that don't fall apart after you sell them. So they've got to be tough and hardy before we sell them. Mm -hmm. And so, as you can see, there's um, there's been good rain the last three years, but now we're heading back into a dry time. And it's either anything that hasn't been eaten, the grass is lignified and there's not much protein left in it. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's going to be... So this really sorts the hay from the chaff as to yeah. who performs and who doesn't. And you see it in the bulls straight away. Yeah. And so that's what our environmental pressures around selection revolve around. And so in Australia is, so summer, is that the wet season? Over yeah, well, we're, we're, so we're only 40 minutes to the coast. So yeah. we're quite coastal. So it's lower protein than further west. Okay. But we get slightly more reliable rainfall and it's, um, we'll usually get one or two s storms if we're lucky in September, October. Mm -hmm. Then nothing much until after Christmas. And then it'll be wet through January, February, March. Uh, and April sometimes. And then it dries off again. Okay. Yeah. So there's a few months where you get a bit of rain, but the rest of the year is mainly just yeah, and we, survival of the fittest. We're, you know, theoretically a 38 inch rainfall, but we've averaged 31 for a lot, you right, know, majority yeah. of the time. And then when it's a drought year, we can get 10. So <laughs> that'd be a tough year. <laughs> so uh, my main thing is heat tolerance as yeah. well. So we service tropical Australia or northern mm -hmm. Australia and any arid environments and particularly if people are wanting to breed Angus and get an Angus premium well they need to adapt it somehow because they just don't they're not bred for these conditions yeah. so instead of crossing with Brahman we, we've provided the alternative by crossing with either Tuli, Tuli or Mashana and um, we probably environmentally it makes more sense to cross with a Thule because it's got a dilution gene that's why they're all gold so their the color gets lighter and lighter to blend in with the environment and obviously albedo effect it's much cooler being yeah. gold than black yeah um, whereas Mishona gives us a nice alternative for people that want to maintain a black animal because you get black Mishona and red Mishona and they, they're just first cousins Thule and Mishona they're both from Zimbabwe one was developed in the low felt, so in hotter, drier, arid environments, and one was developed in the high felt um, with l bigger volume of low protein grass. So they're okay. smaller framed, bigger rumen, whereas Thule are bigger framed, better compensatory weight gain. So wh when they, whatever feed they do get, they thrive, they do really okay. well. Okay, yeah. Because they've had to adapt. Um, yeah, coming out of a desert environment where they've got to utilize every bit of feed that they can get. Okay, and so is there a lot of Thule in Australia? Uh, there's hardly any full blood Thule, but there's thousands and thousands of Thule infused animals okay. all across the north. So majority of the AA Co, Kidman's, Napco, um, all used Thule when it was imported in the 1990s to make up a tropical northern composite. Mm -hmm. But what happens, they no one retained the nucleus herd and that's what I've been working you know, to, I'm getting to, just the full yeah just the full blood because with a composite you breed composite to composite you gradually lose heterosis yeah. over time and that's sort of where we arrived at and mm -hmm. so now people are looking to reinfuse full blood Thule back into improve other other Angus or Santa mm -hmm. Gertrudis yeah. or Brahmin so um, as we head into this drought and heat conditions um, yeah instead of using big terminal um, Brangus sires possibly mm -hmm. they'll you know breeders will head towards more moderate frame size animals because there's going to be lower availability of protein so then yeah. it's easier to finish a medium framed animal that's heat tolerant yeah. and drought resistant than it is a, a big f animal when it's a flush year and there's lots yeah. of feed availability so that's that for today's video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.